Welcome back to Board Game Breakfast, the first board game breakfast of 2016, and I have some exciting things to talk about today, two of them. First of all, at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on today, we are launching the Dice Tower Kickstarter. Now, last year we put out about 1,500 videos, a thousand of them or more were reviews, top 10 lists, this board game breakfast show, Z doing board game blender. We also put out a, uh, a weekly audio podcast. We have Dice Tower News. We have our website. There are many different shows and different things that we put together. And it is our goal, and we wish to always maintain this, that all of that is free for you guys, the listeners or watchers. And we hope that you enjoy it. And we would ask you, if you think what we did is worth anything, then go to the Kickstarter and donate to us there. It's completely up to you. We have some really cool promos and some really good rewards, or maybe you just wanna go in and just support the Dice Tower with no rewards at all. Either way, every little bit counts, and every part of this, you know, just telling people about it is a big deal to us. In fact, it's such a big deal that I thought I would run a contest. We have some cards. Let me show them to you. So if you win this contest, you are going to get one of these new cards here. This is for Dice Masters, and these are from the Dungeons & Dragons Dice Masters. But the space here is blank, and so different people from uh, Wizards of the Coast, some of the lead designers, developer, art directors and such, have drawn little dinosaurs on these. So there's one red dragon, there's another, here's a blue dragon. And so if you are one of the winners, you will get one of these cards, which are one-of-a-kind cards. These blank cards will be available for different people to draw on, but here you have it drawn on from one of the developers or designers from Wizards of the Coast. I also have this card here, um, which is a cable card, which is signed by both of the designers of uh, Dice Masters. And so you're going to get one of these cards. So you're, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven winners. Each winner will also get one of the promo cards for WizKids. One of these cards randomly will also be thrown into the mix. And three of the winners are also going to have randomly thrown into the mix. One of the Demon cards for Cosmic Encounter. This was a special card that they gave out at Cosmic Con. You can see though the, the token there. And two winners are also going to randomly get one of the bags uh, that's in both, both of these bags are signed by both the designers, both Eric Lang and Mike Elliott. So those are the prizes. So if you're interested in getting some of those cool Dice Master promo cards, then just tell people about our Kickstarter, whether it's a blog post, a Twitter post, a Facebook post or something, and then just email me. The subject of your email, put Dice Tower Promotion. Put that in the subject, send it to me at dicetower at gmail.com and you'll get added to our contest. And we'll announce the winner of that in three weeks and we'll send those cards out to you guys in the mail. And I'd like to thank WizKids for donating those cards and also all the other companies who donated things to the Kickstarter. That's very exciting. But the Kickstarter, and by the way, you can find a link to that here in our video or you can find a link to it on our website. We'll make it as easy as possible to find. But that's only one thing. On Thursday, we are doing our annual live gaming marathon. This time, it's going to be me, Sam Healy, Z Garcia, Jason Levine, um, Rob Oren, and Eric Summers flying in. And we're going to be playing games for a long time, maybe up to 24 hours. That is going to start at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time this Thursday. So come on out, come join us. I hope, hope that you enjoy watching us play the games. We're gonna be putting up a list of games that we're gonna be playing off the top of my head. I know we'll be playing Cosmic Encounter and Sheriff of Nottingham and Blood Rage and um, Zombie Side and lots of different little party games and things. Hopefully it'll be interesting and entertaining. I uh, hope you guys have fun watching us do that. There's lots of other stuff coming up this week, but before we talk about anything else, let's get to the news. In 
the news this week. Games Workshop is bringing back Blood Bowl. There's not a whole lot of information on this, just some pictures of the game, but it certainly is something that's happening, and Games Workshop continues bringing back all their older games, well, at least many of their older games, it seems one at a time, and that, that's going to be intriguing to see how that works out, but there's certainly a lot of fans of Blood Bowl. Speaking of a lot of fans, Pandemic Legacy has reached number one on BoardGameGeek.com. Just, you know, causing great consternation amongst everybody for whom this seems to be incredibly important. Hint, it's not that big of a deal. And there are over 4,000 votes. People obviously really do like the game. Will it maintain number one for a while? Does it matter if Twilight Struggle's number two? Well, I don't really seem to care that much, but a lot of people are really invested in this. Either way, it's obviously a game a lot of people like, so congratulations on getting there. Um, Fireside Games has made some 3D files available for Village Crone where you can go and print these out. This is something I think we're gonna see more and more companies doing as the year goes by. Also, Days of Wonder made a solo variant for five tribes available. You have five tribes, no gaming group to play it with? Well, you are in luck now, so you can go find this at their website. AEG has announced an expansion for Dice City, All That Glitters. I'm very excited about that. I really liked Dice City. Pretense, which is another social deduction game, think werewolf and stuff, but this one looks like it takes place around a gaming night. Uh, as from what I can tell, Essentially, it's kind of like if you help clean up a game, then you score points. So you're going to try to, you're going to say, okay, well, I'm not the one who's cleaning up a game, so I'm going to make sure that so-and-so doesn't clean up the game. I'll take care of it. I, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued about that. And Twilight Squabble, which I think is kind of, it's a Cold War short game as opposed to things like Twilight Struggle. Bombix has announced a, a couple of games coming up, but the one I'm really interested in is Histrio which you are a troop, an acting troop, coming in and trying to impress the king and things. Uh, some cool artwork, and Bombex puts out some pretty neat games. In sadder news, iLevel Entertainment, who did the game Nature of the Beast, they've announced that they're shutting down. Now, this is interesting, I think, for a couple of reasons. Lots of companies shut down. Most companies don't announce it. And I'm kind of glad that they did here, because most companies kind of fade off the scene, and they're gone. Lots of new companies start every year, but lots of companies fade out. And so I love entertainment. I enjoy Nature of the Beast, and I've met the guys. The Anna Cole brothers were always super nice and friendly to me at the different conventions, and I wish them luck in what they do in the future. Oh, the new year. What a glorious time for resolutions and so forth. It's also a time for people to get new calendars and throw the old ones out, which is pretty wasteful and confusing if you think about it. The calendar as we have it is pretty imprecise and nonsensical. There are an inconsistent number of days in each month, and the sequence of days and dates don't line up year after year. I mean, shouldn't Halloween always fall on a Saturday? Wouldn't it be great if the 4th of July was always a Friday, so we'd always get a three-day weekend for Independence Day? Now, very much like the rule systems of complicated games, the calendar as we use it is a product of years of development and refinement, not all of it logical. In 1582, Pope Gregory XIII introduced the Gregorian calendar as an improvement upon the Julian calendar, introduced by Julius Caesar many years earlier. And we have pretty much stuck with that calendar for 500 years. And you thought it took a long time to get official FAQs on Smash Up. See, the problem is no one person sat down and wrote up the calendar. It developed over time, with changes and contributions from lots of people. There have been several attempts at calendar reform in the modern era, none of them successful. One such effort was led 100 years ago by Moses B. Cotsworth, who came up with a perfectly precise calendar of 13 months with 28 days each, so four perfect weeks, and then one extra day for New Year's, adding up to 365. It was perfectly logical and adopted by absolutely no one. There is one perfectly logical calendar in use right now, the calendar of Harptos. 12 months, each with 30 days, then five celebration days that fall between months. So you don't need any kind of silly rhyme to remember 30 days, half December, May, June, and November, or whatever. Unfortunately, the calendar of Harptos is only used in the forgotten realms of Faerun. So while you're straining in the new year for a perfect calendar, just remember there is one functioning out there, just in the realms of Dungeons & Dragons. 
Today we're taking a look at something completely different. This is from a company called Adventure, Adventure Sense. And this, you're going to be able to use these. These are basically beads here. You can see they're little tiny beads. And yes, they fall out if you're not careful with them. They get around that have a very strong scent to them. And you can use them to enhance gaming experience. For example, this one here is Bombed Out Ruins. And this one, um, well, smells like smoke a little bit, a little bit of ashes. Then we have this one here, Vampire's Lair, which just just smells disgusting. I, I don't know. It smells like a kind of a putrid area. And then this one actually smells pretty nice, and that's Enchanted Forest. It's a nice, happy, almost like fresh leaves and so on. And then this one here is Wizard's Tower, which says a cozy room with rich smell of pipe tobacco. Well, I'm not a big fan of pipe tobacco, but... You know, I guess it is what it is. And you can see that each of these also has some very distinct colors. Now they sent me some, also some little packs of samples here. So this one here, um, you can see there's some blue ones. This is fish stocks. And this one smells like rotting fish. Um, it's, of all the different scents that they sent me, it's the worst. They also have, this is field of battle, which smells like sweat and blood. City Streets, which smells like, I don't know, just the city streets. The Mummy's Tomb, which smells like putrefaction. We also have the Moldy Crypt, which smells like even more putrefaction. And then Time Machine, which, oh, let me opt to give this one another quick sniff. Time Machine, what did that one smell like? It, it smells kind of like nothing, like um, a, a sterile room, I guess. I don't know what to make of these. It's an interesting idea, right? Except for these ones that smell really bad. If I'm running a role-playing game, maybe that's what I want. I want to really get the players into it. And if that's the way you are, then yes. For board gaming, I want my room to smell good. So maybe I'll use something like Enchanted Forest, because that has a good smell. Um, while things like Vampire's Lair, I don't, I don't want to use that. It's, just, it's gross. In fact, I need to get the lid on that one, because it it's already smelling up the room. They have a nice look to them. It's just that I don't, I mean, I think the number of people who both like to smell things and play games, I mean, <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious that many gamers already have a strong lack of smell. Um, but hey, if this is kind of a unique thing, no one else is doing it. And if you have a role playing game or in a board game that you really want to bring out the smells that in another sensory object involved, they certainly have a lot of them involved. This is not something I think that I'm that interested in, but if you are, again, the company name is Adventure Sense. Sun Vassal here. Jason Levine. Today's question comes from Matt, and he says, is there a reason why we make our top 100 games? You did yours last year. Yes. I did mine. And is there a reason that you would have a game in your top 100, but it's not in your collection? Do you have all top 100 of your games? I do have all top 100 of my games. Can you think of a reason why you wouldn't? Um, if I ran out of space, no, actually no. If I ran out of space, I would get rid of some bad games I had. I would never. I don't think I'd ever. I mean, they're my top one hundred games. You games are gonna run would, out of space soon. Yeah, and when I do, I will get rid of some of the bad games. I'm not gonna get rid of the games that are one, some of my top one hundred games of all time. I have a collection of four thousand. There better be room for at least the hundred that I like the most. Because if there isn't, there's something wrong with me. Okay, then that's fair. Now, for me, there is a possibility. I think I have all of my top one. Actually, I don't have all my top 100. Uh, there's a couple that I don't have. Here's an example. Twilight Imperium 3. That's my top 100, but I don't have it because I rarely play the game, and if I do play it, I'm going to play it with Sam or Jason Tesser or somebody else who, who already has, has it. So there's no reason for me to have it because I'm never going to play it without these guys. Yes. And if I moved away, which I don't plan on doing, if I moved away, I'd find someone else who has it. Do you have Twilight Imperium 3? Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Enough people in the group have it that I don't need to own it because that's an event game for me. Um, and that's mostly the only ones I would have. Like, like Jason said, I have a much smaller collection, one-tenth his size. Um, but uh, it's still four, 350 games and my top 100 there because if a game is not my top 100, then why would I keep it? Or if I get rid of it, I guess would be the, the converse. If I got rid of a game for whatever reason, 
then it probably isn't in my top 100 any longer. So you'll see games that are in my top 100 from, let's say, 2006 that I don't have anymore, but yeah. it's nine years worth of games. That, oh, no, 10. It's 2016. I keep forgetting. Yeah. Happy New Year. <laughs> All right, so that's that. Uh, now, I do not own every game in the Board Game Geek Top 100, but that's a difference question. We'll talk about that sometime. I think I might. I'm not sure. I'd have to look at what their Top 100 is. I, might. I know what number one is. Is it Pandemic Legacy? It now? is. <laughs> All right. Anyhow, <laughs> until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Send us your questions at dicetower at gmail.com. Previously on German for Board Gamers. That was disappointing. As you may have noticed, if an English word ends with an E, the E is always silent. Well, almost always. Usually... Oh, shut up! On the other hand, if a German word ends with an E, the E is never silent. So, this nice gentleman is Uwe Rosenberg, not you. As for the pronunciation, use the E in bed as an approximation. There you go. E. The German I is a lot easier. It's simply E. Now for the combinations. The German IE is pronounced... No, 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 no. The German IE is always pronounced E as well. Same as in believe. So, what's left? Ah, oh, yes, the other way around. EI is pronounced A, similar to the letter I. Let's wrap it up with a couple of examples. Watch out for the A's, E's and I's. Hase und Igel. Hase und Igel. Um Reifenbreite. Um Reifenbreite. Die Speicherstadt. Die Speicherstadt. Join me again next time when we talk about this. No, seriously. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the 101. Today we're going to be talking about miniatures that don't come exactly the way you need them to in board game boxes and how you can fix them. Sometimes you'll get them and they'll have bendy swords or maybe they're even lean forward like this. I'm going to show you a quick easy solution to this. So let's go down to the table and take a quick look. Right here we have some very, very hot water that we microwaved for a while, close to boiling. And over here, I had thrown some ice cubes, which obviously have melted already, into this cool water. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how this is done. So you're just going to take and dip the miniature. And as you can see, this one is kind of just not where we want it to be. We want to soften the plastic. So what we want to do is just take the end of it or take a pair of thongs to protect yourself. Right now, all I'm trying to do is just get him warm enough to move him. And we'll keep it in here for anywhere for about 20 to 30 seconds. Now, once we're done with that, we're going to move him into position as he softens up. And then as he softens up, what we're going to do is we're just going to keep on dipping him into the hot water until he softens up enough. We can bend him into the position that we want and dunk him exactly into the cold water. And once we do that, we just leave it in there for the model to cool from the hot water, take it out, and miraculously, we were able to get him back to the position that he was supposed to. The softer plastic is very moldable and very easy to, to do. So all you need is some boiling water to actually change the way the figure is. So there you have it. A quick and easy way how to fix your figures. So there you have it. That's this week's edition of Painting 101. I hope you find it helpful, and we'll see you next time. Hey folks, because this is the week that I'm launching my Kickstarter, I don't know how many of my reviews are going to come out this week, but there's a couple that I'm pretty sure we'll be talking about. I'll be talking about the new Magic the Gathering ex uh, board game expansion. I'll be taking a look at Raiders of the North Sea, um, probably the new version of Telepathy, and I'll be starting a new series of videos. It's going to be called Every Game is Awesome. This is me and Jason Levine, and we'll be taking a look mostly at Euros. This is a category that people say that I'm weak in, so I'm going to bring on an expert with me, and we'll be taking a look at a couple games this week. We're going to start with Nippon and King Chocolate. 
Um, so there's also a couple other games that I'll be taking a look at, and of course all the other reviewers will be doing games. Um, Board Game Blender is going to be going up this Thursday, and of course all of our live gaming. Actually, Board Game Blender may go up a different day. I'm not sure when that will go up. It's going to go up sometime this week. Hey, let's keep moving on. Chaz Marler here from Pair of Dice Paradise, currently. Board games make up 90% of my monthly entertainment budget, the other 10% being spent on bulk candy and unicorn memorabilia. So to stretch my entertainment dollar as far as I can, I buy the majority of my new games online. So I was intrigued when I read the news about Asmodee's recent announcement that as of April 1st, 2016, they are planning on enacting a new policy that will, among many other things, quote, grant additional discounts to the brick and mortar specialty retailer while not granting those discounts to the online specialty retailer. It is likely that online discounts will not be as disproportionate as they have been in the past relative to pricing offered by many brick and mortar retailers. Asmodee's statement suggests that the intention is to reward the brick and mortar stores that best market Asmodee products by potentially forcing online retailers to increase their prices, thereby closing the gap between prices offered by physical and online retailers. Now, some suspect that as a result, online prices may increase by several percentage points, allowing selected friendly local game stores to better compete with online retailers. However, is that really how markets work? Has there ever been an instance in which leveling the playing field by artificially increasing the prices in any sales channel has benefited the consumer? I mean, after all, Every business, whether physical or online, works tirelessly to find its economic equilibrium, the highest price that can be charged before it reduces demand. Online prices are typically a certain percentage lower than prices in brick and mortar locations, because both sales channels have discovered their own economic equilibrium. If online sales increase, then it's possible that brick and mortar stores will simply increase their prices to retain the previous percentage. Because once consumers become acclimated to a price adjustment in an economic equilibrium, it becomes the norm. The result is higher prices in every sales channel, not the creation of some fictitious level playing field where it rains candy and a unicorn becomes president. Let's hope that Asmodee rethinks, or at least clarifies this potential market manipulation before it goes into effect this spring. Otherwise, come April 1st, we consumers may be the ones having an April Fool's joke played on us. Hey folks, every year I make predictions about things that I think are gonna happen in that year. Now, some of these predictions are founded in, you know, knowledge and things that I'm trying to figure out about the gaming industry. Some are pure blind guesses. Some are hopeful. Some are not so hopeful, but I just think they're going to happen. Last year, I did not fare too well. I think I got four or five at the most right out of ten. So I assume that I will continue to average, but I'd love to make my guesses here. And then maybe you guys in the comments can tell me what you think is going to happen in 2016. Now, um, these are in no particular order at all. Here we go. 10 things I think will happen in the year 2016 in the board gaming industry. Number 10, I'm going to repeat from last year. <laughs> I think there's going to be a major scandal involving a fairly large board game company. I'll say one that has more than five games. Not a new Kickstarter company, but an established game company. Um, I hope this does not happen, but I think that it's going to. Number nine, I think I'm going to make a prediction here that all of the big gaming conventions, so we'll say Essen, Gen Con, Origins, um, I'll, I'll go with those three. Those are the three biggest gaming conventions. I'll say that all three of those will grow by at least 5%. 
I think we're, the, the growth that we've seen in gaming conventions has not yet slowed down, but I think they will all grow by at least five. I'm almost want to say 10, but I don't think Essen and Gen Con could handle a 10% growth, but we'll see. So I'll say five. Then, legacy games. They're very big now, or at least Pandemic Legacy is big, and we got Seafall coming, but no one other than Rob Davio has announced any sort of legacy games. So I'm going to say that this year, less than three, okay, three or less legacy-style games from people other than Rob Davio are going to be announced. I think a couple will be announced, but it's a very difficult thing to design. And some people are expecting a wave of them to come, I'm going to say that wave is not going to come, or at least it's not going to come in 2016. I might be wrong, but we'll see. Number seven, I think Pandemic Legacy at the end of the year, December 31st, or whenever I do my look back at these, which is somewhere in the last two weeks of December, I think the, the Pandemic Legacy will still be number one board game on Board Game Geek. I don't know. I think it's possible. I think it's a strong enough contender to stay there. Number six, I think you will see another major merger of gaming companies this year that's as earth-shattering as, let's say, Asmodee and Fantasy Flight. Maybe not quite so big because I don't know that there's companies big enough for that to happen, but I think that it will be major news and people will talk about it for a very long time. Speaking of Asmodee, I predict for number five that the Asmodee and Fantasy Flight game changes that they've talked about in their pricing structure when they go into place in April, that there will be a huge fuss about them for about a month. And in about, uh, let's say, by the time September and October roll around, there will still be a little bit of grumbling, but people will have acclimated and it won't change things. But I also am going to include that I think Fantasy Flight will back down. I keep saying Fantasy Flight, Asmodee, USA, whatever. I think they will back down on one of the changes by the time we get to December. One of the, maybe it'll be a small thing, like a concession. I think they'll pull back on that and we'll, we'll see. Um, anyhow, uh, let's see. I think that the top 10 ranked games at Board Game Geek next in 2016. So at the end of the year, I'll do a search and look for the top 10 ranked games at uh, of board games from 2016. I think four or more of those 10 will be Kickstarter Kickstarted games. I think Kickstarters. It's going to be a year we're going to see a lot of solid Kickstarters released. So that's the way I'm going to kind of measure it. Number three, I don't know how to really quantify this one, but I think we're going to see a deluge of these social deduction games, werewolf, resistant type, similar things. We're already seeing many of those announced, and I think we're going to see maybe 10 to 15 of them come out this year, just a whole pile of them. I'm getting a little weary of them myself. Then number two, oh man, I hope this one doesn't happen, but I think the Magic the Gathering board game will have lost all steam by the end of the year. I, I assume that as the year goes by, I, would, I don't know what they plan for, but I would, I would guess they'll release two or three more expansions over the course of this year, and that none of those will make a huge impact. And I'm gonna even go farther out and say by 2018, this game will be dead. Now, I would love for myself to be wrong on this one. I would love Wizards to take this game and run with it, but it does not look, or Hasbro to take this game and run with it, does not look like they wish to do so at this current time. And then my number one prediction, and again, these aren't in any order, I think Games Workshop is going to be suddenly and slow, not suddenly, but slowly over 2016, by the end of 2016, people are gonna start looking at them as a board game publisher, they're still gonna have their whole miniatures line, but with Blood Bowl coming out, and I'm gonna guess they'll announce a couple other games over the year, and people are gonna start looking at them, and board gamers are gonna start taking them more seriously than other in the past where they just kind of wrote them off as just another miniatures company. What do you think's gonna happen in 2016? I don't know. That's my crystal ball. Tell me in the comments what you think. Let's keep going on with the show. Hi everybody, Suzanne here with this week's Future Board Game App. CCGs are both loved and hated within our community, so when a new one launches with an underpinning of rock, paper, scissors for the mechanics, can it thrive in a discerning market? Well, that's what Earthcores tried to do, so let's take a quick look. 
I'll start out by saying Earthcore, like Magic, is impossible to cover well in two minutes. There are so many features in this game, I encourage you to look into it more if this overview piques your interest. Earthcore's base gameplay is exceedingly simple. Players take turns placing cards in one of three lanes. Each card has earth, fire, or water as an element, and when all the cards are placed, the facing off cards in the lane do a simple rock, paper, scissors check. Fire beats earth, earth beats water, and water beats fire, with the losing cards controller taking damage equal to their card's risk value. The gameplay depth and complexity really comes in with the special abilities cards have that allow you to manipulate everything from a card's element to its placement and beyond. And perhaps the most compelling feature of the game is that the cards are meant to be crafted and customized. You can combine cards to create custom card ability combos that fit your strategy, which is both really cool and kind of overwhelming for casual players like me. Similar to Hearthstone, Earthcore has a ton of gameplay options that include solo play campaign, casual online play, and ranked competitive tournament play. And like other CCGs, the key in Earthcore is your card collection. You can unlock some cards and some in-game currency through gameplay, but of course you can always invest real money to buy more boosters. The production quality in this game is top-notch, but it is a processing hog, so it doesn't run very well on older devices, and you have to be connected to the internet to play. The game is easy to pick up and learn, but casual players will likely want to stick to the campaign mode because, like other CCGs, the difficulty ramps up very quickly as people who invest in the game as a lifestyle game whiz by other players. Earthcore Shattered Elements is an excellent game that has all the bells and whistles and all the pitfalls of other CCGs, but it is a fun game and it's free to download, so give it a try. And that's it for another board game breakfast. Folks, there may be some Q&As this week. I'm not quite sure if we're going to do that because our, our energy is going to be going into that uh, mega gaming marathon that we'll be doing this Thursday. And we hope that you come join us virtually, hang out, talk to some people, and see if we're any good at playing games. Who do you think will win the most games? Probably Jason. Who do you think will have the most fun? Definitely me. So we hope that you guys come out and join us for that. And check out our Kickstarter. Again, we're really appreciative of everybody who's involved with that. Folks, I'm really excited about 2016. This is the first board game breakfast, but it definitely ain't the last. Thanks so much for watching the show. I'm Tom Vassell. Y'all have a great day. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.